Okay, let's open up our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. We will be in verses 11 and 12. I contemplated going through 17, but these two verses just stuck out as I was reading through them. And, and they're the type of verses that, you know, you're reading through the scriptures and you come across some verses that are convicting to you personally. So you just kind of want to run through them real fast and go to the next section and hopefully not deal with it because sometimes we don't want to deal with things that we struggle with. And so I thought, well, let's deal with it. Let's look at these two verses and, and really let's really dig into them and find out what Peter is really saying here. And so um, you'll be challenged today. Put your seat belts on. Stay in your seats. Don't run in and out because the Spirit really wants to minister to you. Because He wants to empower you and strengthen you to do great works. And you can't do great works if you're living a life contrary to Scripture. You just can't. There's no power behind it. It's like turning on the light switch and no light comes on. Why? Because there's no amperage. There's no power behind that light switch and so it's not going to work. You might think it's on because it's early in the morning and you can see, but it's not on. And don't be deceived because the enemy wants to deceive us. Let me give you a quote by Pastor Chuck Smith. He said, there are those people whose hearts aren't really fixed. It isn't a true commitment. It isn't a full commitment. They've made a partial commitment of their lives to God. Part of them serves the Lord. Part of them serves the flesh. They love the Lord partly. And because of that, they are very unstable in their walk. And they are fearful. What Chuck is saying is, is there are people who are Christians, but they're half-hearted Christians. They're not fully committed with the Lord. And because of that, their walk with the Lord is unstable because they don't know what to do. And they're being tossed between one world and the other world. And in one sense, they're even fearful because they know what God has taught us and they fear God in reverence. Someone said, either be all in or get all out. There is no halfway. There is no halfway with Christianity. Is that the truth? Does Scripture teach that? Of course it does. Revelation to the, lurch of, to the church of Laodicea. Jesus said, I want you hot or I want you cold, but I don't want you lukewarm. If you're lukewarm, what did he say he would do? He spits you out. He vomits you out of his mouth. He vomits you out. That, that's, that's harsh. That's hard to understand. But that's the reality in, of Christianity. We can't be half-hearted. Either we are fully committed or we're not committed at all. And I hope that you choose to be fully committed because your salvation depends upon it. Your eternal security is based upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. Last time we met, we read through verses 9 through 10, and we got the context here of what Peter was talking about as he was encouraging the persecuted believers there at his time. He said, you are chosen generation, a royal priesthood in verse 9, a holy nation. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of his name who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy but have obtained mercy. Now, those are encouraging words. If we were just to read that, we'd go, hallelujah, we're a child of God, we've got power, we're a priesthood, we're royal. I mean, you're just like, yeah, Lord, we're, we're on fire because we have all these promises, all these gifts and mercy upon mercy. You know, and, and we love that type of stuff. But then Peter all of a sudden comes to verses 10 and 11 and he says this, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Ooh. The Christian living among the world. How does a Christian live among the world? Peter is saying, look, God loves you. He has called you with a holy calling. And gifted you. You're being persecuted. But I want you to hang in there. Because there's a tendency under persecution. There's a tendency when trials come to fall away. 
to turn back to the old life, to those lusts, to those desires. Don't do that. Don't give in to that. You're better than that. You're greater than that. And so we need to be an example to the Gentiles. We need to be an example to this world that, that we are fully committed to God so that when they see us and they reject us and they mock us and they ridicule us, that they will stand before God knowing that they had denied the truth, that they rejected Jesus Christ. How do we today as Christians live in this world? How do we live as Christians? How, how do our youth live as Christians? You know, some of you that are younger in high school. How do you live as Christians? The same truth applies to those that are out of high school and are living in college. And those that are now living in the world and working in the workforce that aren't going to college, who graduated or, or are in the workforce, same truth applies. We all should live for the Lord. Whether we're in high school, whether we're in college, or whether we're out of college. We all should live separated lives unto the Lord. As believers, we live in a world. We're a part of the world. And it's difficult to live in this world, but we're to be separate from the world. That's what the Bible teaches. This is what Peter's talking about. And so let's look at how a Christian ought to live while he's in the world. Let's look at verse 11. Saying, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. Let's stop there. I'm going to touch on this for a little bit. Peter first says, Beloved. The word beloved, you might think that he's saying you are my beloved. Like First John, when he's speaking to the disciples and to the Christians, he's saying my little children, my fellow friends, you know, my cherished ones. That's not what Peter's saying here. The word is agape, but it literally means a dear one or they were very much loved by God. In other words, Peter is saying you are loved by God. And that's the first thing we need to really know. God loves you unconditionally. Gave his son. And if you believe in him, he'll give you eternal life. But he loves you no matter what. He wants the best for you. And oftentimes, wanting the best for you means that you need to change your life. Because God's best takes a changed life. It means that you have to live by his standards and his rules. Because he loves you enough to tell you what's right and what is wrong. And how you should live if you proclaim to be a Christian. And it's all out of love. Understand that when a person rebukes you or corrects you, it's out of love to get you right with the Lord. So that you are walking with him in the fullness of grace, in the fullness of God. And so he starts this verse here with beloved, loved of God, cherished by God. He says, I beg you. Now, the word beg there is, is better translated urge. I urge you. But it implies an earnest persuasive address. It's aimed at encouraging them who are loved by God to change. So I'm urging you. If I could urge you. Well, how many times a pastor would desire to urge someone not to do something? You know, if I could just persuade you. How many times I have sat with people who, who were going to leave because of this and that. And I've tried to persuade them. And I've used every angle I could because my whole purpose was to keep them here. And, and help them understand and then. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't persuade them. In fact, I got in trouble because of it. But the heart was there to persuade them, to direct them and to guide them. And this is Peter's heart. I'm urging you. I'm somehow, if you can grasp what I'm saying, if you could understand that God loves you so much that he doesn't want you to go down this path. You, that is those believers who are sojourners and pilgrims. The word pilgrims means to settle down alongside of a pagan. You know, this isn't your home. You're living next to a pagan. Uh, you're a part of their circle, but yet you're not a part of their lives. He uses this phrase pilgrim in chapter 1, verse 1, when he writes to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus. These are believers who are being persecuted, who are suffering. They're under trials. And they're living in a time where their hateful actions against them. And so as pilgrims, they're living in a hateful world, just like we're living in a hateful world. There are non-believers who don't like Christianity, and they literally hate Christianity. They don't like what his Christianity stands for. There are some believers that respect Christianity and understand where it came from, and, and they don't have a hate for them, but a respect for them. They don't believe it, but many hate Christianity. We are 
on a pilgrimage in a hateful world. A pilgrim is one who sojourns to a foreign land. It's not his land. He doesn't belong there. He's just journeying. Not like our forefathers who came from Britain, came to this land to dwell here. Even though they're called pilgrims, but really they weren't pilgrims because they came here for a new life, a new world to dwell in this place. Pilgrims is to come here knowing that you're not staying here and that you're going to go back home. One who comes from a foreign country to dwell by the natives of a city, a land, or even a stranger. And since heaven is our home, this world is foreign to us. It is not our home. This world is not our home. The New Testament speaks about Abraham and many of the other believers who were pilgrims. Abraham was a pilgrim in the land of Ur. He was going to the land of Canaan as a pilgrim of God. A place where God was going to use him in a mightily way, but, but not to dwell and to live. Everything we have, everything we own, everything that we think is ours is owned by God. And is for a specific reason. To help us in our pilgrimage here on this world. That we would glorify Him. We're living as aliens in a hostile world. Yet, we are to glorify God in it. Now that's the struggle, isn't it? As believers, you're here because you have professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it's now difficult realizing that in doing that, I have basically said I will now live for God. As difficult as that may be, I will now live for God. He will now be my Lord and I will have eternal life. And now the challenge comes. How do I live in a hostile world that's always attacking us and our Christianity and our beliefs, trying to tear us down, trying to remove it from us? Peter explains how believers should live as exiles among a world that rejects the message. There was a story told about some Christians who were on vacation and they traveled to the Middle East. This is what it said. They heard about this wise, devoted believer, old believer. So they went out of their way to visit him. When they finally found him, they discovered that he was living in a simple hut. All he had inside was a rough coat, a chair, a table, and a battered stove for heating and cooking. And the visitors were shocked to see how few possessions this man had. And one of them blurted out and said, where are all your furnishings? And the old wise man looked at them and said, where are all of your furnishings? He said, well, we're vacationers. They're all at home. And he looked at them and said, all my furnishings are at home. Then he said it again. They're at home. This isn't our home. That's his point. I have enough to meet my needs here. Everything I own is up there. It's in heaven. I'm just a visitor here. I'm just a sojourner on a mission to glorify God while I live here on this earth. You see, when we ask Christ in our hearts, we're agreeing to separate ourselves from this world. We really are. You can't mean that you want salvation and it costs you nothing, right? You can't mean you're telling me that because that's not what Christianity is about. It costs you something. It costs Christ his life. He gave everything on the cross. He took your place. And he's giving you eternal life. So what is he asking you? To live for him. To separate yourself from this world. And give your life to him. And so Peter says, because you've asked Christ into your hearts. And now you're separated from this world. This is how you ought to live. Look at the next statement. Abstain from fleshly lust." Which war against the soul. You are to abstain. We understand that word abstain. We use it for abstinence for young teenagers. Abstinence. Have no sexual relationships until you're married. That's what the word means. Abstain from that. The Greek word here is apo. Means away from. In other words, hold yourself constantly back. You have to be in control of yourself. Hold yourself back. Understand who you are. Understand your struggles. Understand your faults. Understand your passions, the less that you may have. And you have to hold yourself back. Abstain from them. That's the challenge for believers today is to abstain from these fleshly lusts. These fleshly lusts, 
these cravings, these strong desires that we have, like we have for food. If we don't eat, our stomachs let us know that we're hungry. And if we don't eat long enough, then our bodies start to let us know. And so we eat, and oftentimes we're so hungry, we don't care what we eat, just get it in my mouth because I'm so hungry. We end up eating the bad stuff. So with lust, our bodies crave lustful things. Depending on the individual, depending on the struggles, they all vary between us all. There's a story of a, a pastor of a Calvary Chapel, and I even hate sharing the story, but this is the battle that we all struggle with. He went on a trip to Israel, and it was finally revealed that he was having an affair with his son's girlfriend. And she went with him to Israel, and that's when it was revealed. That was his battle and his lust, and it warred for his soul, and he lost. He lost the church. He lost, if you can only imagine, the relationships in his family. That was his battle. You know, what is your battle? What is your cravings? What are those things that are warring for your soul? That word war means a military service. It's performing something in your flesh. Like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, you know, the things that I know to do that are good, why ain't I doing them? You feel like that sometimes? Like, I know I should do this. Why am I not doing them? And then the things I know I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing them. It's like, why would I do that? And of course, grace, you know, in Christ is great. And he said, thank God for there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, verse 1. God's grace is wonderful, but we can't stay. We have to battle in that war. Like what one translation said, be constantly holding yourself back from the passionate cravings which are fleshly by nature. First, it takes a matter of the will. Secondly, then, it's the application of that will. You have to recognize that this is a battle, and it's a fleshly desire, and now I have to battle against it. And a lot of us struggle in those areas. And there's grace there as you struggle to have victory over these things. You see, when we live in this world, we're not of this world, and so we're battling the things of this world. Our flesh is battling in those struggles. And we're kind of like a fish that lands on water, and he starts to struggle. You notice that about a fish? Throw your, your line out there, hook a fish, you bring him in, and then he's on land. What does he do? He starts jumping all over the place. He's squirming, he's flipping, try to grab a hold of him. He's flying all over. He's twisting, he's jerking, he's jumping. Why is that? Because he doesn't belong in this world. He's not a part of this world. He's on foreign soil. He needs to be in the water to feel comfortable, to survive and to live. And so he is suffering while in this world. How many feel, especially during the holidays, you go to your relative's home, how many feel so uncomfortable while you're there? I, oh boy, a lot more at first service than, than at this service. Why is it that you feel uncomfortable there? I feel uncomfortable at times. It's because you're in a foreign land. And you go to your relatives and they're drinking. And then you're hanging around them and they're trying to get you a drink. And you're like, I don't want to drink. And, oh, come on. Oh, yeah, I forgot you're a Christian. You know, and then all, you, you just like, all right, I don't want to be here. So you go find a corner and you sit down and you're like, why am I here? You feel uncomfortable. You're like that fish out of water. You know, and you're squirming and you're twisting, you're moving. You're like, let's go. I don't want to be here anymore. I'd rather go to church. I'd rather be with believers that believe the same thing. We can talk about the Lord all day long and what he's doing than being there. See, that's how a believer is to feel in this world. I don't blame them. And it's understandable. I think it's totally understandable. I think that if you go to your relatives, you're going there for a purpose. And that is to be a witness, to be a light and to share the gospel message. And that's it. As I told you before, my brother you know, just got into an accident where someone ran into him. And I, I really believe it was, it was the, the devil. This guy was a homeless guy. And he described him as wearing his big black cape with a hat on. And he's swarming on the road like this. And he sees my brother coming, so he stops and he's just going straight. And my brother thinks, okay, fine. He sees me. I'll be able to pass him. As he gets close, he runs right into him right at the last second like he was after his soul. And I told him that. I go, he, like, he's after your soul. He goes, yeah, I know. Strange. I, I, I agree with you. 
And he says, well, what does it take to get you to wake up? And he just looked at me and said, he goes, you know what? Bring it on. Bring it on. I'll take it all. And I'm like, oh, boy. And at that moment, I'm just like, that's it. I'm done. I just had to get away. I didn't even want to talk anymore. You know, because they just don't want to listen. They have their ideas. And I don't belong there. You know. So I went off somewhere else. And that's where I was talking to an 87-year-old lady. And I started sharing with her about Jesus Christ. And then I felt comfortable because I was on my mission. You know, sharing with her. We are to feel uncomfortable in this world. Because we're not of this world. Did you know that kangaroos can't walk backwards? You know, kangaroos, are, they can't walk backwards. They really can't. I don't know why. Maybe their feet in the back are too big or what, but they can't walk backwards. We can't either. We should not walk backwards. Jesus said, anyone taking his hands to the plow, to the kingdom of God, and goes backwards is not worthy to, for the kingdom of God. If he looks back at the world, he's not worthy of it. You're going to take that plow, take it, and go all the way. Either you're all the way in it, or you're all the way out of it. You can't be lukewarm. You remember, the Lord heard the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah. So he sent the angels down to warn Lot. And when they came to Lot, they said, get your whole family out of here. You don't need to be here. You should be uncomfortable living among these people. And yet you're not. You need to get out because judgment's coming. And so it's a picture of the rapture before God's judgment comes, right? Because God's judgment is coming upon them. He's going to totally annihilate them with some sort of sulfur atomic bomb. Even to this day, nothing grows there. And so he's moving his people out. And so as he's moving them out, he tells Lot, make sure nobody looks back. Make sure no one desires that world, that old life. What happens? Lot's wife looks back. She turns into a pillar of salt. Because she liked the world. She loved the world. She was comfortable in that environment. Lot understood. He reverenced God. He believed his word. So he just looked forward and kept walking. And the Lord spared his life. Now who knows, but don't quote me on this. Just a thought. If that's a picture of the rapture, who got left behind? The half-hearted person? The one still in this world? Just a thought. We want to be on fire for God and not half-hearted. We can't be walking backwards. It just doesn't work for the believer. So our flesh is at war with our soul. Listen to what Peter said again. I beseech you as strangers, as pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust. Abstain. Turn back from them. Hold yourself away from them. Paul said the same thing in Ephesians 5.15. See that they walk circumspectly. While you're in this world, walk rightly. Walk with wisdom. And then 1 Corinthians 9.24. When you run, run that you may obtain. When you run in a race, you, you want to win. You're not running. Guess what? I'm going to be in a 5K run because I, I want to be in last place. Okay, why are you in it for? Because I want to be last place. No, you want to be first place. You're thinking, I'm going to win this race, even though you're out of shape and you never win it. But you want to win this race. That's what Paul is saying here. When you run as a Christian, you run to win. You run to cross that finish line, to get the crown, to look at your Savior and say, I've tried the best that I could to live for you. The believer is in a warfare. He's in a warfare. The word soul, there is um, P-S-U-C-H-E is the Greek word for like psyche. Is that part of the man which wills and thinks and feels. In other words, the willpower, the reasoning, the emotions. That's the soul that he's talking about. And the flesh is at battle with that soul. That part of you that feels, that desires, that hungers and has a choice to do or not to do. That's, that's the part that the flesh is at battle with. And so, Peter says, abstain from them. He gives us a list of them in, in verse 1 of the same chapter. Lying. He says, lay, he says therefore, lying, laying aside malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil, evil speaking. He goes, those are works of the flesh. Don't do that as believers. Paul gives us a longer list. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. I want you to see this. Paul gives us a long list of the works of the flesh. Now, we may come under some of these 
listings. And we may not, just depending on who you are and the struggles you have. It's all different. Galatians 5, verse 19. And he's very clear. He says, the work of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. Now, as we're reading this, think of the world and how they fit right into this. This is how the world acts. This is how our culture is. Adultery is no problem for them. I used to work for a boss that was in what they call an open relationship. So if he felt like going out on a date with another woman, he could do that and his wife was fine with it. And his wife, would, from what we heard, was laying around with other people there in corporate America too. And they were fine with it and they were still committed to one another. That's adultery. Our world's fine with that stuff. It's okay. Isn't it funny how the world, you know, this is their view and they're trying to push their view on you and they make you feel like you're the strange one. Isn't that funny? They almost make you feel like you're questioning your faith. Like, am I right or am I wrong? Am I being too critical and too hard? It's interesting how the world makes you feel that way. It makes you question your faith. Because they believe it so much and because the whole world believes this. And we're hearing it from TV, from movies, from everything that we think, here we are all alone and this is all happening. Maybe I'm wrong. I shouldn't be this harsh. And it's not harsh at all. This is love. This is God's commandment. So it says the work of the flesh is adultery, fornication. A fornication is living in a situation or having relationships with people out of wedlock. Uncleanliness, lewdness. Lewdness is those things like we're going to see here um, this coming Sunday or, or the first with the Rose Parade. I don't know if you noticed this, but um, the plan is is to have a wedding ceremony. Between two men. And these guys are just like handsome looking guys. And they're laughing and smiling. And they're ready to have this huge little wedding right after the parade. Now that's, that's in your face. We're going to tell you how to believe that homosexuality is okay. And that same sex marriage is fine. Now it would have been different if, if they would have had a, a, a biblical marriage afterwards. They've never done that. Why not? Because they're, they're not into that. They're wanting to let the world know this is okay. And so this is outright, blatant attack on Christianity and Christian moral values. You know, now, a lot of Christians are going to boycott. They're going to call the news network, whoever's hosting it, and let them know. I mean, I think you should voice your opinion. We've seen it work with Duck Dynasty. And we need to do the same thing. That's lewdness, though. That's taking God's word and just being lewd with it. Lewdness is these parties when you go down 4th of July and Huntington Beach and all these girls going wild and then drinking and doing all these things. That's lewdness. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, even heresies are works of the flesh when you're falsely teaching God's word. That's a work of the flesh. Envy, murder, drunkenness. It's a work of the flesh, being a drunk. That means that you're an alcoholic and you're drinking every single day just to feel normal. He used to have a neighbor. and He was an alcoholic. And every morning, I'd wake up in the morning, he'd come out and we'd say hi. He had his cup of beer with him. And that's all he drank was beer all day long. And he had that cup with him all day long filled with beer. It's the only way he could function. Because he had to keep a norm, so he had to have so much alcohol. That's drunkenness, revilings, and the like. And then he says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty clear. If you're practicing these things, you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a, a person I know in therapy, beautiful lady, and she's been living with this um, this person for quite a while. And she's a believer. She used to go to a Calvary chapel, but she said she kind of kind of didn't like what they had to say. And so she found a more seeker-friendly church that doesn't teach the word and doesn't really convict her of, of her sins. And so, so um, she's been going there. She's been living with this guy for years. And she just recently told everybody, oh, I'm engaged now. We're going to get married. Next year, which is good. Finally, she'll be out of it and then she'll be okay with the Lord. You know, but she's practicing it because she's still doing it right now. 
She's practicing it. And according to Paul here, he says, if you're practicing such things, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. You have to get out of it or you have to get married. In her case. Any of these things. If you're practicing wrath, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, envy, murder, drunkenness, heresies, you're practicing, you're literally practicing to deceive people. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I feel sorry for a lot of those TBN teachers who are who are deceiving people because of money. God wants you to give, 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 and you won't be blessed unless you give. That's a lie. That's a lie. God doesn't need your money. Paul did give us the fruits of the Spirit. Though. Look at verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You do that, there's no law. You won't be condemned. You have eternal life. And then he goes on and says, And those who are Christ, if those who are really Christ, they crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Those that are Christ will crucify the flesh, the lust of the flesh. You can turn back. So Paul is saying what Peter is saying. Abstain from these things. Crucify the flesh. Live rightly before God. D.L. Moody captured the meaning of Peter's exhortation very clearly. He said, I have more trouble with D.L. Moody than with any other man I know. The man I see in the mirror each morning is my greatest impediment to holiness and godliness. Stop saying the devil made me do it. Stop with the rationalizations. Stop saying that this person's making me do what I'm doing. You know that, that when you get into arguments with your spouse, be careful. Because it's sometimes the tendency is to say, you know what, I don't care. And then you go do something stupid. Because you're in this argument. And you're upset. And then you, now you can say, yeah, but you made me do it. Why? Because I didn't listen to you. Because I didn't agree with you. You know, no, you're responsible for yourself. Nobody's made you do anything. You know, you have a choice to be who you are. You know, just like people, well, they make me so mad. No, 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 no. No, you make yourself mad. You don't have to get mad. I know it's frustrating. I know it's hard. And it's difficult. But you can just say, hey, I understand. And I choose not to worry about it and go forward with God. And just let God deal with it. Our greatest enemy is ourself, isn't it? We struggle with ourselves in our own flesh and our own lust. You know, women, ladies, young ladies, your, your struggle is with you wanting to feel romanced, security, and just that, that sense of that somebody loves you and belongs to them. And so you're looking for that. And so it's so easy to believe a man that tells you all the right, oh, you're so beautiful. You're the most beautiful thing in the whole, and you're like, oh, this is the guy, I know it. You know, and then you give in. Oh, come on, just, let's just go to bed one time. Come on, we're gonna get married anyway. I, believe me, we're gonna get married anyway. Don't believe the lie. Because you have no one to blame but yourself for believing him when he never intended. Because his whole thing, and guys are like this, most guys, is they're only looking for one thing. And that's the bed you. That's it. And have a relationship. Before marriage. And so you have to be aware of that. And he's responsible for himself. We're to abstain. And that word abstain, as I said, is to hold yourself back. But, but it's actually like, like holding yourself away from the reefs. The reefs in the ocean. that can cut you and damage you. And so you've got to hold yourself away from that. From sin and lust that will damage you. It was William Grinnell who said, What lust is so sweet? Or so profitable that it's worth burning in hell for eternity. Is there a lust that's worth it? There isn't. It's easy to see the results of the flesh in the lives of people physically. You look at an alcoholic. It's evident that they struggle. You can see the damage it does to themselves, to their families, to their children. And it's sad. All for a drink. Or someone who's having a relationship with somebody along with the 350,000 people who are getting STDs every 24 hours because they're having a relationship with someone. More than likely, the people that you're friends with, some of them have STDs and you don't even know it because they're sleeping around. 350,000 every day. 
Because of passions and lust, this stuff is going to kill you. Proverbs say, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? You'll be burned. You can believe that. Isn't it interesting that you can, that love can wait? Oswald Chambers said, love can wait, worship can be endless, but yet when it's lust, the lust says, I gotta have it now. Gotta have it right now. Let me have it now or I'm gonna die. Kinda Esau and Jacob, right? Esau was hungry. He's like, I'm starving. Give me, give me your food right now and I'll give you my birthright. You can have it. He gave his birthright away for a bowl of soup. You know, it's crazy what we do for lust. So Peter is painting a picture of our old enemy, our nature, and dwelling flesh, and how it's in opposition to God and godliness that war against our soul. See, the strategy of Satan is is simple, and it's to delude God's word. And that's what the world has done. It's diluted it. It's watered it down. It's saying abstinence, that's old-fashioned. Don't worry about it. That's the old way. That's old school. We don't do that anymore. Today, we live with people. We get to know people. And then we see if we want to live with them for the rest of our lives. That's a lie from the enemy. That old-fashioned, it's legalistic or it's unrealistic or it's harsh. Or, you know what? I'll change in the end. It'll change in the end. I promise. I, promise. I won't always do this. That's what, those are lies. To get you to compromise the flesh. God would have you abstain, as he said. And then in verse 12, he said, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. So abstain from these lusts. Why? So that you are honorable among Gentiles. That when they see you, they see Christ in you. The word having means holding your conduct honorably. In other words, that word honorably is is kind of like saying beautifully. Like a person can be so beautiful that they, they're holding you and they're beholding your beauty because of your obedience to God's word. So as the world, the word Gentile there is not speaking of just non-Jews, it's speaking of the world. So as the world looks at you, they can see the beauty of Christ in your life. The Bible says we're not of this world. We... Put the little bumper stickers on our cars, right? Not of this world. And some of us really believe it. Others don't. Because we still drive really fast. And we're smoking cigars and cigarettes. And we're cussing and swearing. And you know, listening to rock music on there. you know. And then we got, out of, not of this world. But you're living like the world. I remember there was a guy that had gone to church years ago. When I was at another Calvary. And he had one of those Calvary stickers on his car. And I was right behind him. And so I'm like trying to honk. I even honked a couple times a wave to him. And all of a sudden I see him smoking away. I'm like, okay, you know, there's liberty. Okay, he might be struggling. Eventually he'll, he'll get off of it. You know, because you won't last long with the Lord. You know, he'll convict you. And then all of a sudden he, he opens up his door. And I thought, maybe he saw me. And he takes his ashtray and he just throws it all on the street. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe this. So, you know, he spud off and I didn't want to follow him or anything and really embarrass him. So I just talked to him the next day. I said, man, I was right behind you. And do you know what you did? And he was squirming like a fish and twisting and like, oh, man, I am so sorry. I didn't mean I go, don't I, you don't have to be sorry to me. You're supposed to be a light and a witness and you have this bumper sticker on there and people are seeing you dumping this stuff out there. What do you think they're thinking of Christians? They're looking for excuses. How many times have you, by your conduct, pushed Christians away? How many times? Now, I understand that we're not perfect, and you see that bumper sticker. I'm not perfect. I'm just saved. That's another excuse, you know. But how many times do we push people away because of our conduct? Because of the way we're living. Yeah, I'm a Christian, and you've got a beer in your hand. Yeah, I'm a Christian, and you're out there partying with everyone else. You're at work and you're telling jokes and everyone's laughing. Oh, I heard, I thought you were a Christian. Well, I am. Okay, that's interesting. I like your Christianity. We're to be different. We're not of this world. The Amplified Bible puts it this way. Conduct yourself properly among the Gentiles. Believers are to be witnesses to this lost world. Listen to what the Bible says. John seventeen eighteen. We are sent into the world. We are sent with a message into this world. Mark 16, preach to the world, Jesus said. 
Philippians 2.15 and Matthew 5.14. You are the light of this world. Titus 2.12. Live godly in this world. Romans 12.2. Do not conform to the world. 1 John 2.16 and 2 Timothy 4.10. Love not the world. 1 Peter 2.11. Passing through the world in James one twenty seven and James four have no friendship with this world. The Bible is very clear how we are to treat this world. We're not of this world. We're not a part of this world. It is foreign to us. We don't live here, and yet we want to live here, and we think this is our home. You know, it's so much easier for someone that doesn't have anything to realize I'm just a sojourner here. There are several people here, probably about four or five, that live in rooms. That other people own. And they just are content to live in that room. And they're faithful to serve here every Sunday. Some of them are here at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning being faithful. They have nothing but the Lord. Their reward's in heaven. And those of us that own houses, boy, that's the challenge. That's my house. And we feel like it's ours. And we have ownership of it all. It's God's house. And He can take it away at any moment. We have it because He wants to use it for His glory. It's not ours to use for our own will or purpose. This isn't our world. This isn't our home. And we're not to give in to the worldly things. See, unsaved people are watching believers and they're speaking against us. They're looking for excuses to reject the gospel. And if you're going to be a witness to this to this people that are lost around us, you have to live right before them. They need to see Christianity work in you. And that's why as I started this message, you know, either you're all in or you're not. Because people are looking at your Christianity. Don't misrepresent Christianity. I hope that you would understand God loves you, you're beloved, and He wants you to live rightly. And to display that relationship with Him. So Peter goes on and says that when they, that is they, who's they? Every time the Bible uses it, they, that's the world. That's the unbeliever, they. And that they is big. It's the whole world. It, it, it's CBN. It's ABC, CBS, NBC. It's the liberals. It's the Democrats. And it's a lot of the Republicans who are trying to, to get you to live a certain way in culture because of our society and not according to the scriptures. That's the world. When they speak against you or they look down on you because they feel like they're the elite. They're wise. They're educated. They've evolved. And we're archaic. We're old fashioned. You know, we believe in this God that still says homosexuality is wrong, adultery is wrong, fornication is wrong. That's archaic. We don't believe that anymore. We live in a day and age where we can get tests and to make sure we don't have diseases and then we can go with other people and we can just keep testing to make sure everyone's fine and we're being responsible, you know, that type of thing. And they make you feel little because you feel like you're old-fashioned. There's nothing wrong with being old-fashioned. They look down upon you as, as evildoers. Isn't that interesting? They look upon you as evildoers, like you're evil. Like you've done something wrong. And that is far from the truth. See, the early Christians during the time of Paul were being persecuted and falsely accused and looked down upon. They, they were calling Christians back then terrorists. They blamed the Christians for burning Rome. So they said, the terrorists, the Christians. You know that they called Christians atheists? Isn't that interesting? They call them atheists. You know why they call them atheists? Because they didn't believe in idols or worship of emperors. So they were considered atheists because they only believed in one God. That's what the word atheist really means and came from. So today when you speak to an atheist, they don't even know what that word, where that word came from. It came from a person who believes in one God. Atheism doesn't mean you don't believe in God. It means you believe in one God. See, they're so confused. They don't understand that. Not only that, they were considered cannibals because of the Lord's Supper, eating his body and his blood. It, they were considered immoral because they had to love one another, care about one another. Uh, they were considered uh, as hindering society and the economy and progression because they would not buy idols. They would not buy their worship items and, and scents and Things like this that participated in idol worshiping. And also they would lead insurrections because they were letting the slaves go. And they were finding freedom. And they were saying, oh, they're, they're, they're changing everything, these Christians. And so they were being persecuted by the world. Just like we're being persecuted today. They speak evil of us today all the time. Oh, they're keeping us back. 
If we can get rid of them, boy, this world would be a better place. How about uh, being called a hate monger because we hate homosexuals? Do you hate homosexuals? I don't hate homosexuals. I have relatives that are homosexuals. I talk to them all the time. You know, I don't hate them. They're living wrong, just like an alcoholic or an adulterer or anyone else. They're living wrong, but we don't hate them. We want them to turn to God and have eternal life. That's what we really want. But they don't understand that. We're evil because we hate them, but we don't hate them. You know, we keep the culture from advancing because of our moral values. Because we want everyone getting married first. Because we want, you know, the marriage to be between a man and a woman that's hindering the world. In reality, there's only 2% that are homosexuals in this world. 2%, very low amount. Not enough to worry about. How about, how about being fired because of your beliefs? Because you have Christian beliefs, you're fired. Look at Phil Robinson, Duck Dynasty. They fired him because he went to Romans chapter 1, somewhere else, and he read out of Romans chapter 1, just read the scriptures. And it ta- he was talking about God's judgment coming on those who take uh, things and worship them. You know, animals and beasts and things like that instead of worshiping God. And then one of those things was man. How men will worship other men and women will worship other women. Same thing. And he was talking in context of what it was saying. And so he got fired from A&E. We're letting you go. You're not representing us. You know, you're misrepresenting the culture. You're misrepresenting society. And all because this homosexual agency called up and says, you better fire him. Otherwise, you're going to see what's going to happen to you. And so they jumped the gun and they did it. You know what I love about that whole story? I love the fact that he stood his ground. I'm a believer. This is what I believe and I'm not changing. You fire me, I'm fired. I don't have to work for you. And then his family came along and said, same for us. We're going to back our pops. We love him. We believe in truth. And we're going to support him. I love that when family does that. They back their pops. They're there for him. And it worked. It worked. Because A&E said, okay, you're not fired. You can come back to work. Yeah, they saw they were going to be losing $80 million too. And then, of course, all the support from other believers and so forth. Because they stood their ground. They all said, it's not about the money. It's the principle. It's what truth is. You know, it upsets, I was telling my wife, we were talking about this the other day. It's amazing how we live in a culture today of tolerance. And we're letting people get away with what's wrong. Even believers, when they do something wrong, we let them get away with it. No, it's wrong. You need to repent. You need to go and get right with that person that you've done something wrong to. And we had someone here who who divided the body. And they still haven't repented. They took several people with them. They haven't repented. And, and, And people embrace them. They still have him over for a cup of coffee. And it's crazy. So he's going along thinking he's fine. He's not wrong. He's wrong. And God knows he's wrong. And he needs to correct that. But we embrace people that do things wrong instead of standing up and saying, this is the right thing to do. Years ago, um, we had a family member who was living in an immoral place. And I made the choice as the scripture says, they have nothing to do with them. And so I separated myself from them. And then I told my boys about it, and they agreed, and they separated themselves also. There were a few of my family members that said, that's harsh, and that's mean. And they were believers too. That's harsh, and that's mean. How could you do that? What kind of Christian are you? You don't have love in your heart. And I said, on the contrary, I do have love in my heart because I care for their soul more than their living style. So they went ahead and they they continued to have fellowship and and all of this for them. And in fact, one of them even challenged me. And I said, you know what? Why don't you call Pastor Chuck on the radio and ask him? They did. (laughs) And it was on the air. And Chuck said, well, as hard as that sounds and I understand how you feel, he's right. And she's just like, ah. Got upset, you know. How can that be right? It's right. It's what the Bible says. He said, and Chuck said, most people don't do it. And it's a hard thing to do, but he's right. Do you know that that person stopped living that way? They repented and got right with the Lord. Was it because of the others 
who said, no, it's okay, continue on? Do you think that's why she stopped that? No, it's because those who stood on the word and said, look, we're not having fellowship. It doesn't mean we don't love you. We love you and we want to have fellowship, but not until you get right. That is what changed them. That is what turned them. Because they valued that relationship more than the other ones who just came along and said, no, we'll accept the way you're living. We have no problem with it. Yeah, because they're in the world too. We need to stand up for what's right and what's wrong. We need to stop living in this culture and having that perspective. That's what Phil did in this world. He stood up and he won. And it is a big win for us as Christians. So big that they're, they're saying that there's a possibility that that uh, maybe the whole mindset will change a little bit. It's one of the only programs that people let their kids watch because it's so wholesome on TV. One of the greatest programs. So, Boy, I really got off on that one, didn't I? <laughs> so Paul warned of these, I mean, Peter warned of these persecutions and how they would come. Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You will be. If you're going to live for Christ, you will be. Expect it. That's the separated life. You need to live what you believe, though. So, when they speak evil of you, and they will, let it be, look at the next statement, that they, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God on the day of the visitation. Boy, I really went over. Let me just close up with this. Because you're living rightly, they're going to look at their lives, either one at one point or another. Either now, and they're going to say, wow, this person is willing to stand up what's for, for right, for truth. And they're going to see their errors, and they're going to come to the Lord. Or, they're going to be hard-hearted, and when they stand in that day of visitation, when God comes back, and they're standing in that judgment day, then they're going to know the truth, that they live righteously. And God will judge them righteously in their actions. And so on that day of visitation. So we're lights, we're salt, we're examples. And God wants us to live as Christians, not half-heartedly, but wholeheartedly. I like what one person said. They worked for a column syndicate newspaper and they wrote about a story who a man wrote in and said, look, I'm so frustrated because I feel like I'm the only believer on staff. There's no other Christians. The guy wrote back, in a nutshell, he said this, look, pretend that you're a CIA agent and the United States has sent you to Russia and you're the only spy How would you feel then? You'd feel proud. You feel like you're doing something for the United States of America. There's a plan. There's a mission. says, so you're a Christian and the only Christian? You're on a mission. And you're the CIA Christian to infiltrate and to share the gospel with those around you. Don't give up. Don't go back to the world. Stand firm. Stand strong. And serve the Lord while you're in that place, in that position. Let's pray and then we'll partake of communion.